Greetings. In this video, I'm going to discuss the very important and serious subject of building failures. We'll discuss structural integrity and failure, and then we'll look at a couple of different case studies, including the Kemper Arena, the Hartford Civic Center, and the Hyatt Regency Walkway. Before discussing failures, I want to discuss or run through some definitions of integrity, structural integrity, when things are working properly as we want them to be. So integrity, by definition, the state of being whole or undivided, um, an aspect of engineering which deals with the ability of a structure to support its load, to work as intended, um, without breaking, tearing apart, or collapsing. It includes the study of breaking or failure, of course, um, that has, been, that has previously occurred in order to prevent these failures in future designs. The performance characteristic applied to, to um, a component, a single structure, or a structure consisting of different components. So the idea of integrity could refer to a single column, um, a larger assembly of columns and beams perhaps, or the entire building. So the definition pertains to structures of all scales. It is the ability of an item to hold together, a structural member item hold together under a load, including its own weight, and to resist failure, basically. It ensures that catastrophic failure does not occur, which of course results in injuries, severe damage, death, or um, financial loss. Structural failure, on the other hand, refers to the loss of this integrity which is the loss of the load carrying capacity of, again, the single component or the whole structure itself. Um, it's initiated when the material is stressed beyond its strength limit. It causes fracture, excessive deformations, and then occasionally um, total collapse, total failure. In a well-designed system, a localized failure should not cause immediate or even progressive collapse of the entire system. So localized, as the word suggests, it's small, it's local to one specific part of a building. And when that, when it happens on that small local scale, the entire structure should not come down if it's designed properly. When applied to a structure, the integrity of the component must be carefully matched to its individual application so the entire structure can support its load without failure due to weak links. All right. So when a weak link does break, it puts more stress on um, adjacent pieces of the structure, usually. And that causes what they call a cascading failure or a kind of a domino effect where one piece goes and then that that the structural load that that was carrying has to move to adjacent members. And then one piece after another piece after another piece continues to fail. So cascading failure is a failure um, in a system of in interconnected parts in which the failure of a part can trigger the failure of a success of parts. Um, and so this is a term, this type of failure could happen in a lot of different systems, not just structural engineering, but many others. Certain load bearing structures with discrete structural components can be subject to the a zipper effect, they call it where the failure of a single structural member increases load on adjacent members. Properly designed structures use alternate load paths to prevent this type of mechanical cascade failure. So alternate load paths, so that when one part fails, the load um, is, it, so, so the structure is designed so that when one part fails, then the load does transfer paths, move somewhere else, and, and the load is handled elsewhere as opposed to this type of failure where everything is just simply connected and one piece after another just topples. In the case of the Hyatt Regency, which is the third case study we will look at in this presentation, a suspended walkway, which was already overstressed due to an error in construction, failed when a single vertical suspension rod, that's this piece pictured right here, all warped and twisted at this point, um, so that single piece failed, overloading the neighboring rods, and uh, sequentially, like a zipper, everything failed to total collapse, and over 200 people died in this tragedy. 
Structural failure can occur from many types of problems, most which are unique to different industries and structural types. However, some, um, however, in general, there are five main causes. Okay, so the structure is not strong enough or tough enough to support the load due to either size, shape, or shape choice of material. Um, so basically, that would be a design problem. Something was was it was under designed. A second type of failure could be from fatigue or corrosion, so um, caused by instability in the structure's geometry, design, material properties. So over the life of a structure, things move, things get stressed, and they break in time. Um, they usually begin with tiny cracks forming at stress points, such as perhaps um, bolt holes, for instance, square corners. Um, close to the material's edge, these cracks grow. They're repeatedly stressed loading, unloading, so that's the cyclical loading, um, and then they just re reach a point of failure and they, they crack, um, often under normal loading conditions. So the loading conditions themselves might not be um, anything extraordinary, but it's it's from cyclical loading is, is really what it's getting at. So loading, unloading, and just kind of overstressing uh, a, a structural member um, over over a given period, an extended period of, period of time. <clears throat> then there are manufacturing errors, so improper selection of materials, incorrect sizing, heat treatment during manufacturing, perhaps um, failure to adhere to a design, poor workmanship. So this this type says it could occur at any time and is particularly unpredictable. A fourth type has defective materials also unpredictable, so improperly manufactured or perhaps damaged prior to install. And then a fifth type is um, lack of consideration of ex unexpected pro problems, so caused by events such as vandalism, sabotage, and natural disasters, so not, um, not foreseeing unexpected, of, unexpected or uncommon events, perhaps. Um, it could also occur if those who use and maintain the construction are not properly trained and overstressed the structure, so improper use of, of a structure. All right, some broader, maybe kind of kind of behind the scenes, perhaps um, reasons why some of those earlier causes might um, occur. So poor communication is at the top of the list. So in in our business. There is, of course, the design side and the construction side. There are a lot of different players involved in um, in the in the design and the manufacture and the um, the assembly and the placement of different structural elements. So there's there's just a long chain that requires very um, consistent and diligent communication. And when that fails, it it often um, or occasionally has has very could have catastrophic failure. Um, results, catastrophic results, that is. So people, um, team team members or, you know, greater, the greater construction design team not communicating properly with each other. And that's um, what we see in the tragic um, Hyatt, unfortunately. So again, more communication. This one's pointing out between fabricators and erectors, so the people who construct the, the, the assembly and those that install it. Bad workmanship, again goes back to communication often so design decisions um, and the people involved in executing them a compromise in professional ethics and we'll see this one as well a case uh, one of our case studies will touch on this which is a true true tragedy um, failure to appreciate the responsibility of a profession to the community at large so putting our, our safety and our health um, everybody's safety and health before our own interests and one of these tragedies um, is the, partially the result of that, a failure of ethics. Lack of appropriate professional design or construction experience, so especially when a novel structure is used, so especially when there's something new, technologically challenging, we need people with a lot of experience, obviously. Complexity of codes and specifications could perhaps lead to misinterpretation or misapplication. Yes, I think that's kind of related to number five. Um, I mean, yes, codes and specs are complicated, but again, if we have a qualified design team, that, that really should not be an issue. 
unwarranted belief in calculations and in specified loads and properties yes so anything that a computer spits out just believing what you see as they say you know poor information goes in poor information comes out so it has to be challenged it has to be questioned and there has have to be um you know senior team members that have a lot of experience that that could look at such calculations that a calculator is, that a computer is spitting out and to um, challenge and question things that don't look right. Inadequate preparation and review of contract and shop drawings. So shop shop drawings are the uh, a very very critical piece. And again, this will go to our case study on the Hyatt Regency. Shop drawings are what bridge the design and construction teams. So the design team creates um, construction documents, and then the construction team has to produce shop drawings based on them and it's basically the time that the construction team says to the design team it says we've looked at your documents this is how we understand them and this is what we are intending to do and that's when the design team looks at the shop drawings and says yes you understood what we what we're looking for and this meets the goal or no this does not meet the goal we reject this or yes with some qualifications some modifications are need, needed so shop drawings are an important bridge between the two teams design and construction and um often or occasionally um a, a, a um an opportunity for errors and misunderstandings unfortunately poor training of field inspectors yes so that goes back to experience and compressed design and construction times yes because of finances and for a lot of reasons um, projects are perhaps just pushed too quickly and things are overlooked or not done properly so a lot of good reasons um, not maybe not good reasons but um, a lot of uh, you know serious reasons behind the scenes as to why things um, could go wrong very concerning issues Okay, so oh, this is so I pulled this from a, uh, a recent case study of failures in the United States. So going so that's a little little old now from 1989 to 2000, 225 building failures were looked at. Um, the results show that failures in low rise buildings constitute um, the majority of all the cases, actually, followed by multi story buildings at a distant second. So low rise buildings um are, are really the uh, the culprit for a lot of lot of building failures in terms of their functions apartments are the most frequent to fail external events and construction and maintenance maintenance deficiencies have been identified as the most um, frequent principal causes so poorly maintained buildings and so external events could be the overloading i've seen um, examples of decks perhaps at parties that are just overloaded for instance um, so that's probably users that are um, the culprits on that part. Shoddy construction also. External events such as so environmental failures, rain, wind, snow, vehicular impacts and collision. So the first three are environmental and then the, um, the following, the last two would be um, people induced. Construction deficiencies, so improper renovations also, yes, definitely a very big culprit when things are um, renovated and, and not perhaps designed and looked at properly, or perhaps people who specialize in new construction take on renovations, two, two different animals that, exp that really require different experience. Unplanned demolition, poor workmanship, always a culprit or unsafe excavation operations. So excavation is a, a big, big, um, again, culprit for um, failures, both on the job site and after. And maintenance deficiencies. So buildings have to be taken care of properly. So things are allowed to deteriorate, overlooked, improperly maintained. So landlords probably are the uh, culprits in that group. Okay, now we will take a look at the case studies. So these three case studies were explored in um, Why Buildings Fall Down, a fantastic book by um, Salvadori, a structural engineer, and it's a, a just a, a very um, accessible 
kind of easy to read book really does a great job of explaining why bu buildings fail. He also has a book called Why, why Buildings um, Stand Up. So I highly encourage you to um, look into them. All right. So basic. Um, so this this particular um, case study, I believe the title of it is called For Lack of Redundancy. So redundancy, what it is in terms of structural engineering, it allows for loads of the building to be carried through more than one path through the structure. Considered a necessity um, of any large structure, all structural failures can be considered due to a lack of redundancy. So kind of um, kind of a simple phrase, but um, true. If um, if there's if there's always another path for the load to follow to the ground, then then um, the building would continue to stand. When that lack of redundancy exists and the load can't um, make its way to the ground any longer, then failure occurs. Okay, so the first one is the Kemper Arena roof failure. So here it is, constructed in 73, an award-winning um, project stood for only six years before it collapsed. So it's not an issue of um, decay and neglect. All right, so June of 1979, a downpour of four and a quarter inches of rain per hour fell on the arena with 70 mile an hour winds occurring at the same time. So very significant rain, but, um, you know, nothing in and of itself should not be um, catastrophic. So um, after the failure occurred, all the documents were obtained to be analyzed to figure out what happened. It took four years to reach the courts. It settled in two days. Um, the parties agreed to avoid um, litigation. Each had different views of the failure, but agreed that the rain and the wind were of significance. So let's take a look at the structure and how it stands, how it should have remained standing. So it's a massive four acre roof consisted of reinforced concrete supported by steel trusses hanging from three space frames. So um, reinforced concrete supported by steel trusses hanging from three space frames. So the big space frames are these guys, one, two, and three. And the roof was suspended from them. And then here are the steel trusses perpendicular to them. The three external uh, space frames were 360 feet long, 80 feet, 81 feet high, and space 153 feet on center. So just a massive, massive um, uh, building, obviously. So 360 in this degree, 150 is the span between there. And so the space frames were here we see the columns leading or the the really um, the mem trust members kind of acting as columns reaching down here into the pylons. So the load path would be from the roof deck to here to the open web joists over to the larger steel trusses then up to the larger trusses from which they're suspended from and then down into the pylons. All right. Um, the space frame had an equal, equilateral triangular cross section, so that's right here. That's the equal, equilateral triangle. That's the cross section of the space frame. The vertical sides of the portal consisted of the same cross section resting on two conical footings resting on ground piles. So it basically just that triangle turned down and came down to the pylons. Concrete roof was supported by a corrugated steel deck and that's kind of let's see they don't really point to it there but basically sitting on top of these open web joists so that double line running right across there that would be our roof deck joists rested on the system of trusses each consisting of 299 long trusses supported at each end by deeper 54 foot long trusses so these are the trusses here in cross section. As it says there, steel truss. So one, two, three, four, five. Those are the trusses. So open web joists supported by steel trusses, which were hung from the space frame. All three trusses were hung from three space frames 
by a total of 42 connectors. Yes, so right there, and we'll zoom into that. So right where the, um, obviously there's a connection assembly, a hanger assembly. So these trusses are hanging from the space frame, and that's right there. We'll zoom in and see that, and here it is. All right, um, so here's the steel truss right there. This is the space frame, and these are the hangers. So a pipe and then a uh, base plate connecting them. Um, each hanger had to support 140,000 pounds in tension, so being pulled, of course, so that this piece is in tension. Needed to resist horizontal variable wind forces, so um, such a massive thing would ex be expected to move a little bit, so that's why we see a hinge there. Tends to move the roof horizontal, kind of like a pendulum, so expected to swing, expected to move some, and that's why they're hinged. The connection between the bottom of the hanger and the top cord of the truss consisted of a steel plate. And that's what we see right there, base plate. Base plate was subjected to 24,000 oscillations, which introduced oscillating var variations into the tension of the bolts. So the bolts here connecting the truss to the hanger right there. So oscillating variations within the tension so these bolts are being pulled on steel subjected to stress oscillation suffers suffers from fatigue and lowers the load value so these bolts are being being um, stressed being from um, yeah from fatigue so here's the massive roof um, not exactly well doesn't exactly look like that. This is kind of an oversimple. Yeah, it doesn't really look anything like this, but this is just a picture of a uh, diagram of a roof. So provided with eight five-inch drains. So we will see that this is huge, huge problem, way under under designed. Or I forget at this point. I forget if it was a design issue or a construction issue. Um, what was called for and what was actually put in, but not nearly enough drainage for such a massive roof. Um, yeah, so right here. So it required 55 drains. And I forget, again, if it was um, install or design, but how it ever passed inspection at that matter is um, is really, usually, um, obviously a problem. Um, so a few drains allowed for a substantial amount of water to accumulate on the roof. So water is ponding, water gathered, as in a pool, caused the roof to deflect. So the roof is depressed at that point, um, allowing for greater water depth. The water accumulated to nine inches. So that's that's um, unheard of. I mean, it should, should, there's no way you'd want nine inches of water um, ponding on a roof. Water on the roof was aggravated by 90, by 70 mile an hour winds, the, the, which pushed the water all to one side of the roof. Um, with increased loading and deflection, the roof structure then became unstable and collapse occurred. Um, all experts agree that the bolts within the hanger, hanger assembly were the first ones to fail. Calculations prove that a single hanger failure due to a bolt fatigue could cause adjoining hangers to rapidly fail in chain reaction. So the zipper effect occurring. Once one went, many followed. The intensity of the rain downpour, drain deficiencies, wind effects, fatigue of the bolts, and lack of redundancy all contributed. A lot of big big reasons obviously okay so that is the first um and i, I don't believe any was anyone was actually killed in this um fortunately I, I think it occurred while the place was empty all right now on to the hartford arena so 1970 same same time and this is a very important a time when computers were new and there, there was probably a um uh, an unfortunate uh, belief in, in computers and, and, the, and the calculations that they would spit out. Um, so 1970, um, so a very unique and complex type of roof was, um, was proposed by the engineers. It began the assembly. The roof was, uh, roof structures built on the ground rather than in place, hoisted into place, and eventually a ceremony later. So here it is, a space frame truss. Um, before it was in final position, it was measured to have twice the amount of deflection that was predicted. So some deflection is allowed and expected. So that's when, when uh, water or snow load pushes down. We expect this to bend a little bit, but then, of course, 
um, only only to a certain limit, a certain allowable limit per code. And um, of course, with deflection, once the snow or water, water drains, snow melts and drains, then the um, the trusses should bounce back right to where they are. But um, you know, upon upon construction, the deflections were twice that, so massive red flag right there. Engineers express no concern, so that's obviously very concerning. And interesting point here: the contractor installing the fascia panel. So the fascia is um, this band right around the edge. So the fascia is um, on a house of fascias where the gutter would hang. This doesn't have gutters per se the same, but it's this rim board around the outside of the roof. Um, so the contractor installing those fascia panels encountered such difficulty that he had to weld the fascia rather than bolt it. So again, something that's um, you know, manufactured, the pieces are manufactured off site, this really the precision piece of, um, you know, pre precision assembly. There, there really should not be such difficulty putting something together. That really doesn't make sense. So that, again, major red flag. And then again, um, fortunately, somewhat miraculously, no one was killed in this. Um, so the whole thing collapsed, leaving only the four corners standing. I think um, just hours before the, the arena was actually uh, filled to capacity during a basketball game. But fortunately, this happened uh, hours later in the middle of the night. So a uh, very fortunate little miracle there. Um, so here, this is what the piece looks like. So that is one of the pieces. So we could see here that the space frame truss is made up of a number of inverted pyramids. And this is one of the units. So the entire roof measures 300 by 360 feet, constructed as a space frame, 21 feet deep. So that's the depth of this piece here, 21 feet, and space 30 feet on center. So yes, I believe these are 30 feet square. So large um, units making up this massive frame, resembled a series of linked pyramidal trusses. And that's what we see there. So in two dimensions and then in the third dimension. This um, diagram talks about a variety of different um, locations for the different connections and what was designed and what was actually built. So as designed, the allowable force, you could see all of these numbers are um, starting at a minimum of 160,000 pounds and coming up to 100. 625,000 and you could see as built that the numbers were nowhere near what they should have been. So major problems there. Here's a detail of the piece. So a number of angles put together, bolted. Um, this, this detail really doesn't delve so much into um, this. This shows how the different Trusses were connected, but it doesn't really dig into the um, why the failure occurred specifically. This next slide will show us that better, and that's here. So um, the prevention of buckling, buckling. So when we hear buckling, we think of columns typically buckling, but we could also refer to um, maybe struts, maybe you know these bars, these cord members um, could also buckle to the side. Um, prevention of buckling would have required outer top horizontals. To be four times stiffer than the interior top horizontals. So I'm just going to back up a little bit. We don't have the best picture of that. Um, let's go back to this image. Actually, this is one of the better ones. So what buckled, what buckled to the side were were these these top cords here, and within the greater pyramid here, those top cords were rigid were made to be rigid because there was another pyramid on the other side of it. So the interior pyramids were fine because they had adjacent neighboring pyramids that helped um, helped um, not, not allow those top cords to buckle. The problem and the failure occurred on the outside. The outside did not have a neighboring pyramid or neighboring um, assembly to help um, resist that buckling tendency. So that's why it's saying here that the outer top horizontals should have been four times stiffer because they didn't have the neighbor. And then therefore this whole piece pushed out. Okay. Progressive claps. 
could be caused by minor deficiency unless redundancy is introduced. So less than 50 outer horizontal bars were needed to be braced to the frame consisting of roughly 5,000 bars to prevent this. So massive 5,000 bar frame, only 50 more pieces were needed. And somehow, again, this was overlooked. So all these pieces around the end, around the perimeter, should have been um, much more robust than they were. So some design flaws. So dead loads were underestimated by 20%. Um, East-West face um, exterior top layer compression members. So th these are the pieces I was talking about. Basically, the top of the frame overloaded by over 800%. Others in the other direction, 200% and another 70 But um, massive, massive miscalculations or overlooked, um, you know, in... in reviewing the data afterwards. The computer model assumed that all the top cords were laterally braced. That's the problem right there. But in fact, only the interior met that criteria because of the diagonal bracing. So the, the perimeter, the top cords at the perimeter did, were not laterally braced. And that is the problem. The slenderness ratio of the built up diagonals violated a code, okay. Um, other violation were that bolt holes punching through some of the members exceeded 85% of the gross area. So that's usually problematic when, um, obviously we do need to add bolts to structural members, but when you, when you begin just taking out so much material, it obviously compromises the integrity of that, you know, so, um, sorry, the, uh, you know, connections aside, you, you, you can't just strip down the, uh, take out so much you know material and strip down the actual member until nothing is left so major problem there this is all on the design side and then construction interior members were insufficiently braced at midpoints while exterior members were braced at 30 feet rather than 15 feet as specified so a major mess on the construction side and the inspection side how did that pass very interesting, three eighth inch steel cables found throughout the wreckage of the trusses. So um, it was speculated that these cables were used to force the truss back into shape during the installation of the fascia. So major, major problem there. Major red flag that again, you know, general contractor, um, inspectors, you know, why, why was this not caught? Some of the diagonal members were misplaced and the wrong steel strength was used. So just uh, a, really a parade of errors for this project. Um, so the, um, the inspecting body, their conclusion was that um, there was inadequate inspection and quality control, obviously. Very important here. Um, the city should have hired an independent structural engineering consultant for full-time involvement to review the design and the assembly. So in general, any, any deep, even small commercial projects typically involve a third party structural engineer to come in and to review the documents and to review what's going on in site. Um, Hartford did not require an independent peer review peer review for the technical designs on the project for pro private developers. Um, or they did, they did. I'm sorry, Hartford typically did, as is common practice. But since the Civic Center was owned by the city, there was no such review performed. So they waived this requirement from themselves. So a major, major ethical failure, that is. And again, a, um, a miracle, a miracle that, um, you know, and a blessing that nobody was inside this when this actually occurred. All right, finally, the third, the Hyatt Regency, and this was a true, true tragedy. Over 200 people um, lost their life in this one. So this is in Missouri, 1980s. Um, connection was made. So there, so this is the big um, atrium of a uh, hotel. So connection was made by three pedestrian bridges or walkways. So there are two, two parts to the hotel and a huge atrium, and these three bridges connected the two parts. Um, a single one here on the third floor and stacked on the second and fourth floor. Here's a photograph of it. So here's the single on the third floor and then the stacked second and fourth floor there. 
1981 in the evening um, one of them the, the second and fourth floor ones collapsed there's a dance competition going on 1600 people in the area in the atrium um, oh 100, so not over 200 but over 100 100 um, over 100 people died tragically because of this and again just like the other stories it's um just uh you know could have could have been avoided absolutely could have been avoided in this day and age it's um truly truly a tragedy that's this oversight so what happened um so the original working drawings so this is from the structural engineers intermediate supports of the walkways at each of the 30 foot beams consisted of a transverse box beams fabricated by butt welding along their entire length two eight inch deep channels okay so let me just go back and see if i could see i don't think we could see it no well let's see so we can see a little bit here so walkway these are the suspending cables hanging from the roof and then it reaches a beam so coming from the roof beam across to this one down beam across to this one all right so beams are connecting the two suspenders all right and that's what's happening here suspenders are coming down and a box beam made up of two c channels crossing underneath the walkway in the original drawings each bo box beam had a single hole at both ends of the flanges that's what's pictured here so this is the flange right web flange flange so these two flanges are joined to create this box and there's a single hole in a single hole and the rod passes right through um, so there's the threaded rod served as a hanger for both the second and fourth floor walkways so this single pole in tension hanging from the roof supported the two of them that's the original intent okay in this design, the load of both walkways was supported every 30 feet by this rod at the level of the second and fourth floor box beams. Thus, the single rod hung from the roof trusses supported the weight of both walkways. Okay, so yes, this rod supported both walkways. But in this design, the box beam of each walkway supported only the loads of that single walkway okay so here imagine this being the fourth floor the top floor this box beam is not supporting the bridge below it right this box beam is only supporting this bridge because this continuous rod passes right through so this box beam has nothing to do with the walkway below it okay very important this is however what was built and it was a change made by the contractor shop drawings again very important huge huge importance this is where the contractor um, submits their understanding of their of the structural engineers design they said this is this is how we understand what you want and this is what we're going to build and the architects said it was approved and the structural engineer said it was reviewed and this is what actually occurred okay so here in the new design the fourth floor box beam actually supported the loads of both walkways all right because now this rod stops here and that rod is now only supporting this guy and now this box beam picks up the weight of the one below it Okay, so that's the difference. Box, this box beam only supports the fourth, but now this box beam supports the fourth plus the one below it. Major, major change. And catastrophic failure follows. And um, it's not mentioned here in the, um, let's see, maybe it is here. So shop drawings. Um, so this is just what I discussed, the essential element bridging the gap between design set forth in the contract and what's understood by the contractors. Um, Ever-present risk that translating the design at the shop drawings, the contractor may intentionally or in unintentionally alter the design. So it was approved, it was reviewed and it was approved. And unfortunately, shop drawings are sometimes given to 
um, junior, junior designers, junior engineers. And obviously this, um, this, this huge, huge change. I mean, maybe seemingly small to a, a junior engineer, but a massive change um, was approved. And obviously catastrophic, catastrophic failure followed. And, um, you know, 114 people lost their lives. So a, a, tr a massive tragedy, a very, very sad story um, in, in the history of um, structural engineering here. Okay. Um, typically, I say, I hope you enjoyed that. It's not really an enjoyment, um, an enjoyable one, but um, a massive, huge, huge, important issue. The, uh, our faith in computers and our, our eye for detail as, as, as documents move through very complicated um, documents for very complicated projects move through a lot of different hands communication is critical as was discussed at the beginning of the presentation okay thank you